Hey, welcome to yet another video. Now it's been a while since we've done a tips and tricks video. You've been asking for it. You've been saying, how come you're not doing more tips and tricks video? I've been just utterly ignoring you. Well, I can ignore you no longer. Today is the day tips and tricks. So without any further ado, here's some tips that might be helpful. They're very random. They're in no specific order and you might already know them, but I don't care. Watch the video and see if you do. All right. Hey, let's get naughty. Because <laughs> we're talking about knot holes. Now, when you're building a piece of furniture, sometimes you just can't avoid using a piece of wood that's got a big old knot in it, or cracks, or if you're using reclaimed wood, sometimes big nail holes, and sometimes you wanna leave them, but sometimes you want them filled so they're nice and smooth and bits of food and crumbs and garbage and grime isn't getting down in there. The question is, how is the best way to fill them? How is? What is? What is the best way to fill those knots? Now, traditionally, people just reach for epoxy. You might know I'm not a big fan of epoxy. So I tilted that bucket and I poured that liquid snot all over that beautiful maple. And I felt bad about it. But when it comes to filling knots, it actually works pretty good. You mix up some epoxy and you add some color if you want and you pour it in the knot hole and you let it dry. The problem with that is epoxy's viscosity is very, very low, which means it's runny. So you can't just pour it in a knot hole because sometimes the knot hole goes all the way through your board. So you have to do some prep work. You gotta put tape on the bottom of it. You gotta make sure that whatever you pour in the top isn't gonna leak out the bottom and it can create a horrible mess. Not to mention, it takes a long time for that epoxy to cure up. So once you pour it, you can't really do anything because you gotta sit around and wait. So I found a better solution. Thick so because it's thick, yo. Thixo is made by Total Boat, and the thing I like about Thixo versus regular epoxy is exactly in the name. It's thicker, which means you don't have to do any prep work to your board to make sure it doesn't leak out the other side. And if you get the fast cure, well, it cures fast, so you don't have to stand around and wait as long. You just squeeze out a little bit, it mixes right in the tip, so you don't have to worry about the proper amounts of hardener and the activator and all that stuff and you can add a little color in. And then because it's so thick, you just put it into your knots, your cracks with a putty knife, let it dry. It's not gonna have bubbles because it's too thick for bubbles to really work its way up. So you don't have to worry about bubbles forming in your epoxy. It's great for filling knots and holes. And then if you don't use the whole thing, you just take the tip off and you chuck it aside. And then the next time you're ready to use, you just put a new tip on there. Easy peasy, thick so squeezy. Okay, so we put this Thixo on here, which worked wonderful to fill all these knot holes, and now I purposely left it pretty proud, because every once in a while, you know, you do that. You leave it really bumped up. Now, the normal thing for people to do at this point would be pull out the sander and just sand through all that epoxy until you get down to the bare wood. The problem with that is that Without even realizing it, you're gonna concentrate the sander in that one spot, and it's really easy to make a little divot right where that epoxy is, because you're working so hard to get through that epoxy and sand everything smooth. So here's a little tip to help you get rid of that epoxy, make it nice and flush, and you won't get a little divot there when you're sanding. What you're gonna need is just a little trim router. Now, I've just got a spiral bit in here. It can be up cut, down cut, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Now, I've pre-stuck some double-sided tape onto the bottom of my plate here. Then you're just gonna take some scrap pieces of wood. This is just three quarter inch pieces of plywood and you're gonna stick it on there with that double-sided tape. Then you're gonna set this upside down and you're going to adjust the bit so that it is just above the surface of the wood. Just barely, just like that. Now what you have here is essentially a little router sled that you can use to remove all that epoxy material and get it nice and flush. If you don't believe me, just watch this.
Now we've removed the majority of the epoxy and all that's left is the epoxy sitting right there in that knot hole. So once we do this to all of our knots, we come back with the sander. It's gonna save you so much time sanding and you're gonna get a nice flat surface on the top. You're not gonna have a little divot everywhere that you fill the knot hole. So just double-sided tape, a few scraps of wood, nice little router sled. The world, for whatever reason, is very into reclaimed wood right now, specifically reclaimed pine. They love the rustic look of it. They think it's aged nicely, whatever. They want it for their projects. It's just kind of hard to find because you have to find legitimately old pine for it to have that natural look. Now, most people want to look in old barns or old salvage yards, but I was at my local park the other day and I was digging a hole with my son and I actually discovered that you can mine for pine. I was finding all sorts of reclaimed pine just below my feet. It's pretty amazing. I do think mining for pine is somewhat dangerous though, because I found a lot of miners down there that didn't look too good. While we're talking about routers, I thought I'd show you another trick that could come in real handy if you're in a bind. Now we've all been there. You've got a set of bits. This is a set of Forsner bits and it goes up to a certain size. This one goes up to two and an eighth inch. But what if you need to drill a hole that's two and seven eighths, or three inches, or three and three quarters, or four and a half, or six and seven eighths, and you just don't have a drill bit that's that exact size? What do you do? Well, I'm gonna show you a way that you can drill any size hole that you want, and all you need is your biggest drill bit and a router. So let's just say, for argument's sake, that you want to drill a hole that's two and five eighths of an inch, but all you have is a two and an eighth inch bit. What you're going to do is you're going to drill your two and an eighth inch hole with the biggest bit that you have. Now you need to add a half inch to the size of your hole. So you might think you're going to grab the half inch bearing for your rabbit bit, but that's not true because you got to remember that you're going to take out material on both sides of that circle. So you're gonna cut that in half. You're gonna grab the quarter inch rabbiting bit. You're gonna slap it on there and you're gonna add a quarter inch perimeter around the entire thing. Now that's gonna add a quarter inch to both sides, increasing it by a half inch total. And now you're gonna have a two and five eighths inch hole drilled the exact size that you want. And the cool thing is that you can increase the size of your hole incrementally. So if you wanna go up another quarter of an inch, well, you grab the eighth inch rabbiting bearing, you slap it on there and you add an eighth inch. That'll increase by a quarter of an inch. You wanna go up another quarter of an inch, do another eighth inch. You're just gonna to have to go back and forth between the rabbiting bit and the flush trim bit and you can keep increasing the size of the hole as big as you want. If you wanna to go to six and seven eighths, you can do it. If you wanna to go to nine and five sixteenths, you can do it. If you wanna to go to 13 and eight twenty seconds, I don't think that's a real thing. So you're gonna have a hard time with that one. But if you wanna to go to 16 and a half, well, you can do that. Sometimes I fill up my old scotch bottles with iced tea just to freak people out. Sanding. Everybody hates sanding. I mean, that's what employees are for, right? Um... Eh? No, uh, okay. It's inevitable. We all have to sand. And one thing that I hate when I'm sanding is those little swirl marks that the sander leaves behind. They're all over the place and they're impossible to see unless you have what's called raking light. 
Now, a lot of companies sell lights like this one that you can position on the side of your workpiece and it gives you nice raking light across your work surface so that you can see if you have any of those little swirl marks. But the problem with these lights is you set it in one place and it might work to sand that one area, but you're constantly having to move that light around as you sand, set it in different spots, and it can just be a pain to try and hold on to this and hold on to this at the same time. And the other day I was like, you know what would be awesome is if the light was just attached to the sander and you didn't have to move it around. So I went down to the Home Depot and I bought one of these headlamps for $9. This is a Husky brand one and it's adjustable on the angle on the front. The nice thing about this is that you can adjust the headband and so you can stick it right over your sander just like this. It positions the light right at the front of your sander. So while you're sanding, if you need that raking light, all you got to do is reach down, press the button. You can adjust the angle up or down depending on where you want the light. And you've got nice raking light in front of your sander the entire time so you can see every single one of those swirl marks. Seriously, $9. To ensure that you get that nice raking light, get all those swirl marks off your piece. Now that's what I call a bright idea. What are you doing, man? Please don't bother me right now, dude. I'm trying to market my business. Got a drinking problem? Well, my idea is I write a bunch of notes, I stick them in bottles like this, go drop them in the ocean, and voila, people know about my business. This is never gonna work. No, dude, this will work. This is how my Uncle Frank met my Aunt Margaret. Why don't you just build a website? But what if I don't know how to do that sort of thing? I mean, I'm not great on computers. Squarespace is this awesome platform. You get online, you can build a website and you don't even have to know what you're doing. If you don't know where to start, they have a bunch of templates online. So you get online, you pick out the template that best fits your business, and then you can tailor it to fit exactly what you're trying to do. So they already have pre-made templates. I just get on there and pick one. I had this other idea that I would stop making everybody pay just in pennies and actually let people pay with credit cards. Oh man, they make that really easy. You can just connect a square reader to your Squarespace app and you can keep all your orders, inventory, everything right there. And you can take credit cards. Okay, you got my attention. What if I wanna take all of my products and put them online for people to buy all over the world? Um, yeah, that's kind of one of their big things is an online store. You can literally put unlimited products up online. Are you telling me that I could have been doing this the entire time and I wouldn't have had to write all these notes? <sighs> Stupid Jason. Oh, it seems so simple. Dude, all you gotta do is go to squarespace.com and start building a website. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash bourbon moth woodworking and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That easy. Man, I'm gonna save so much money. These bottles are like a dollar a piece from the guy down on the corner. Okay, now this tip has to do with double-sided tape. We all know it, we all love it. I use it all the time. It's probably my most used tool in the shop. I use it to stick templates on, I use it as a clamp. Anyways, that's beside the point. Now the problem with double-sided tape is that normally I would stick it down like so, just like that, and then I would cut it, and I'm left with this piece of tape with the backer on it. Now sometimes you gotta find it with your fingernail and you gotta pick it off and it can be a royal pain and you start to peel up the tape and not the backer and then eventually, okay, then you get it. All right, but my friend Jonathan Katz Moses showed me a tip and he was showed this tip by his friend Tamar at 3x3 Customs. So she showed him and he showed me and I'm showing you. And basically what you do is when you stick your tape down Stick it down like this. Now, instead of just cutting the tape, you peel the backer off like that and you cut the actual sticky tape. And you're probably like, how is that helpful at all? You basically did the exact same thing. Well, that initial time, but next time, now you got this big flap with nothing on it. So now you can stick down your double-sided tape and you got this handle here that you just pull up like that, cut it and move on. It's way quicker if you always leave a little tail of already peeled up backer. 
I hope that helps you stick things. Don't, don't ever build out an Airstream. They're, they're all curved, there's nothing straight, takes forever. Just, just don't do that. Oh, hey. Now, every now and then when you're building, you're gonna encounter dealing with, you know, large round cylinder shapes. Or maybe you're building something for like your dust collector hose to pass through. And you wanna know the exact diameter of that large round cylinder. And it's hard because you can't take a tape measure and just eyeball it because you're never gonna get it accurate. And even if you can get to the top of that cylinder, you don't know exactly where the center is. So a tape measure just isn't gonna cut it. So you might think like, oh, I'll just grab some calipers. But if it's too large, your calipers aren't gonna be deep enough to actually get to the center of that and give you an accurate diameter. So what do you do? Well, here's a helpful little trick that allows you to measure the diameter of large round things. All you're gonna need is a square. This old rusty one is all I have laying around, but that'll work just fine. And another square. And essentially, you're gonna hook your one square onto your other square. And because a square gives you the inside dimensions as well as the outside dimensions, you can create your own calipers using those two squares. And I know this is exactly five inches because I used my own large scale calipers. It comes in handy, believe me. Every now and then you just gotta know how big around that large round thing is. Rubber bands, the most underutilized tool in the wood shop. So many mistakes in life could have been solved if people just would have remembered a rubber band. Anyways, rubber bands are great for multiple things. One thing I love to use them for is if you have two pieces of wood, three pieces of wood, six pieces of wood that you're trying to laminate together to make like a knife handle or something cool like that, sometimes it's hard to get clamps onto little sections of wood. That's where rubber bands come in real handy because you just stick them on there with some glue in the middle and boom, instant clamp, just like that, huh? Another good thing rubber bands can be used for is sometimes if you're gluing up a large project by yourself and you have to hold something with one hand and get clamps on there with the other hand, it can be really hard to get the clamp where you need it to go. But if you take a rubber band and you stretch it over the clamp like so, then all you gotta do is hold on here and it tightens up all by itself. Mm. Ooh. Didn't work very well. You know what? This worked really well on TikTok. Or you can just go to Rockler and you can get one of theirs and they work really well. So maybe that's not the best thing for rubber band. Don't do that one, that's stupid. Rockler clamp. But another good way to use rubber bands, and I think this one is so simple and genius, is when you're dealing with paint or stain or oil like this and you open up the can and you dip your brush in there, your first instinct is to take the brush and you run it across the lip of the paint can. And then you fill up that lip with all your stain or paint or whatever, and then you gotta clean it out because the lid doesn't wanna go back on there. But if you take a rubber band like this and you just put it over the top of the can and down to the bottom, now you can dip in there and you can clean off your brush right there on that rubber band and it keeps the outside lip of your paint can perfectly clean. And you just take the rubber band off, put the lid back on, boom. Clean paint can, rubber bands. And then last but not least, they're great to shoot at your employees in the face. See? Oh, son of a... Sometimes it backfires. And we've all been there. You tried to put together a project, you get out your domino joiner, you mortise a few holes, and only then do you realize you're out of that size of domino. 
It's so frustrating. And yes, you could take the time to make some dominoes, but that's time consuming. And if you order them on Amazon, it can take a couple days for them to arrive. But I just discovered a place that you can order dominoes delivered to your door and it arrives in less than an hour. And it allows you to just continue on with your project and you don't have to wait. Now this one's pretty simple and straightforward and you might have heard of this one before, but I'm gonna throw it out there because I showed this to somebody the other day and they had never heard of it before and they said it changed their life. I don't know how pulling a nail out of a piece of wood can change someone's life, but everyone's life's different, so who am I to judge? Now, if you're using a finish nailer and for whatever reason you get a nail that sits proud or maybe you had to pull two things apart and now you're left with a nail and you just gotta remove it. Lots of people just want to grab a regular pair of pliers and they try and pull it out and one of two things is going to happen. Either you're not going to pull it out, you're going to mar up the wood or the nail's going to break off and then it's going to be way down there and it's going to be really hard to pull out. Anyways, regular pliers are difficult. What you want is a set of these channel locks. Now the reason the channel locks work so good is this nice round profile on the back of the channel lock right there. You're gonna use physics and leverage and you're gonna remove this nail easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All you're gonna do is pinch the channel locks onto the nail and then using that round profile of the pliers, you're just gonna rock it back and easily pull the nail right out of the wood, just like that. Oh, ooh, nice. Oh, it doesn't mar up your wood. Because it's round, it just gives it a nice lift out. It doesn't break the nail off. And every time, it's gonna be super easy to get rid of those pesky nails. And you can move on with your day. Hopefully you enjoyed that video. Hopefully you maybe learned something. I don't know if any of those were helpful. Regardless of all that, check the video description. There's links down there to any tools or supplies we may or may not have used in that video. There's also a link to our Patreon page where you can get behind the scenes, extra footage, live question and answers, coupon codes, cool stuff like that. There's a link to our second channel, Bourbon Bites, and there's a link to our website where you can get some sweet swag. So until next time, go do all that. And we'll be back next week, once again, with a normally scheduled build video. All right, toodaloo.